Hey everybody, this is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Uh, Thanks for tuning in again. Um, Today I am in a beautiful location that, uh, for those of you that get to see some of the video from this, you'll get to see some of the surroundings, but I am at uh, a hemp farm, Hillside Hemp, um, with my friend Sam Moore, who's a hemp farmer and is um, trying to implement uh, more sustainable hemp cultivation practices to help build the soil. Um, help support the local ecology here. And uh, this is our first um, in-field interview. Um, So this will be a little bit of an experiment. A lot of nice farm ambient um, sound around us that I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, Thanks so much, Sam, for joining me and chatting about hemp farming and whatever else we end up talking about. Yeah, thanks for having me. Or thanks for coming out. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so leading up to this interview, we, we spent some time getting some hemp plants in the ground um this summer and i'm just surrounded i mean how many plants um do you have in the ground right now uh about 4400 plants get another seven or eight hundred in this afternoon after after this interview yeah and should be all done for the year is that across like a few acres or how many acres is that it's uh it's approximately two acres of hemp cultivation um and it'll be about five thousand plants in total um which is a little higher density planting than in some other uh, farms that you may see around. Um, There's a few different reasons about that. We can talk about that when we get into it. Sure, yeah. Um, So, yeah, let's just jump into all of that. So um, you mentioned before we got this going, this uh, recording going, that, you know, your main focus is trying to figure out how to cultivate cannabis in a more sustainable way how to take care of the soil improve the land you're on so can you just kind of describe when you're thinking about setting up the farm Uh, because I've been to several different hemp farms and yours is very unique just in how it's laid out I noticed there's no plastic um, on the ground Um, you've got rows that are on contour along the hills um, um, and kind of um, not necessarily contiguous fields. It's kind of broken up where things kind of best fit rather than kind of forcing things in place. Um, so you, can you just share kind of your thought process on your farm planning and then we can kind of get into some of the practices that you implement and all of that? Sure, yeah. Um, so for me, it's really a, just hemp is just one more piece of a holistic uh, farm management approach. Um, this farm is uh, a family farm that will be in my family uh, for many generations and so ultimately it's just about um, stewarding that in the best way possible for you know my children and maybe their children um, after that so um, you know that approach uh, we've been on here for about eight years and um, you know there were quite a bit uh, established here before, um, you know, the opportunity with hemp came about. So, I mean, we're looking at, um, a little bit of a slow to establish food forest with different fruit and nut trees, um, you know, berry vines, a lot of it swallowed up by blackberry right now. (laughs) Um, but, um, you know, this whole farm is about five acres, but there was never really a thought in my mind about ripping everything else out that's established mm. um, just to plant as much hemp as possible. Um, and so that was kind of why we see the layout. Um, it's kind of working within the existing parameters. Um, it's nice to have different uh, sections with wind breaks. Um, I also am fascinated by you know the the different soil structure that we've developed in different areas based on um you know the rotation of crops so Mm. since i've farmed it for the last eight years i know which plots have gone through what phases uh different vegetables um different cover crop mixes um some spots that are uh, newly cultivated um, some that have been intensively vegetable farmed well not super intensive but um, more heavily um and then uh when we do walk around the farm after this you'll notice that there's essentially five different um kind of structures in each of the each plot that we'll see uh, where i'm kind of just trying different things to see 
uh, what works um, and kind of what we can get away with. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of yeah little about that. And what what kind of patterns have you noticed as far as the soil structure? Like you said, in the areas where you've done more vegetable farming versus others that haven't been touched as much, what are you seeing? Um, well, so you know, it's hard to know for sure if we can draw direct correlations to all things. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, the one section that's been farmed the longest does have the highest uh, like soil pest pressure pressure mm. uh there's a, a population of uh what are called gardens and filans which is a rather large um kind of centipede looking guy that um doesn't mind eating fresh uh roots of plants it's not the only thing it likes to eat but when there is a, an abundance of that food and not a lot of other things that's what it likes to get into and so we noticed that really heavy uh last year um, and, um, one thing I immediately noticed is that, um, in, within that section, there was a few areas where, um, I had more companion plants than in others. Um, I did a mm. lot of, um, uh, bush beans, corn, potatoes, um, throughout those sections as well, like intermittent row crops. And, um, and then there was a few breaks where I kind of, you know, ran out of corn and potatoes and, um, never got around to, to establishing other companions. And those areas were more heavily affected by that, that pest pressure. Um, a possible assumption is that there was nothing else for that pest to eat besides that. Right. Um, and then in the other areas, you know, the, pr the presence was still there, but you could identify those pests were also, you know, interacting with other plants. And so uh, with some phylons in particular, um, they can stunt a small plant, but once the roots get established, they usually can outcompete it, um, which is why, you know, planting a little bigger plants a little later, but also just like giving that something else mm -hmm. to... to eat on what are uh what are some of the other pests that you're commonly having to encounter um out here on this farm and particularly when with your hemp farming what are you running into um well um let's see i i see what you know we can call them pests i see you know, right rugs right. um i don't animals get, yes <laughs> overall um there's i kind of come from you know, a mindset of there's an acceptable level of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I farm in the way I, ha I do is, um, by keeping the overall, um, you know, cost and energy of the farming as low as possible allows me to take, uh, maybe a little bit more acceptable loss or, or flexibility there. Mm, um, so you don't have to get so worked up. About, true. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, you know, in the hemp plants, I'll see aphids, um, maybe some spider mites. Um, you know, the thing that probably causes the biggest dent for me is, um, you know, subterranean mammals, um, <laughs> digger squirrels, moles, yeah, yeah. Um, voles, and gophers. I have all four of those. Bastards. Um, yeah, and the thing is, you know, I they're not particularly attacking the plants. Right. It's just that they're, you know habitat happens to interfere with the plant's ability to, to sometimes produce, um, you know, grow bigger. The roots run into air pockets. Mm -hmm. um, and they self prune when they, yeah. Do that. yeah. Squirrels love to chew on drip irrigation lines and cr create a little bit of headache there. Um, which is one of the reasons in the back, uh, lot, um, we'll notice there's a lot of, um, habitat for them to exist uh, besides the cultivated rows. Um, it left large stands of cover crop um, to mature and go to seed, gives them an alternate food source. Mm. Um, I've also seen um, gopher snakes uh, out there mm -hmm. as well, gives them a habitat. Yep. Um, and then we have a nesting pair of uh, cooper hawks um, oh, that nice. are on this, uh, in this area. And so, um, I feel like, you know, overall that's what that is. I do do, um, some, some, you know, integrative pest management. The strategy is basically while they're all contained in a greenhouse, it's easier to give them some preventative care while they're more susceptible. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I use um, some essential oil sprays a couple of times um, that just kind of prevent them from getting, you know, any infestation while they're small and in trays that would then transplant out. And then after that, you know, it's just kind of being aware. Uh, occasionally I'll find a plant that's maybe harvesting a larger population uh, of maybe spider mites. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of just typically make the call of whether that's going to affect the rest um, right. enough. Like, whether you need to cull them or not. Basically. Yeah, and that's, for me, I'll take the loss. I'll just, you know, I'll take a plant and remove it from the garden, um, compost it, no problem. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of refreshing to hear that perspective that, you know, you're basically looking at it of like, well, I could use all of these resources to try to save as many plants as possible, or I can just take these losses and not expend those resources. And I mean, every situation is different, but I imagine a lot of the times you end up ahead with that perspective anyway, especially, I mean, because when you're taking more aggressive approaches to pest management, it's not just a money cost, but also a time cost. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's yeah. all these all these expenditures. And I, I like the idea, too, of... Um, rethinking about the perspective of the use of the term pest and the same as um like thinking about weeds as well it's like well they're they're pests or they're weeds in the context of how we perceive them and how we humans interact with them but they're just organisms doing their thing and sure you know and we've either you know intruded upon you know their natural habitat or we've created a new habitat that mm -hmm. is you know ideal for uh, them to exactly. thrive yeah Yep. Yeah. 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 And, and that's another reason why there's a, we'll notice, um, you know, a higher, you know, frequency of and density of plants throughout the farm, um, overall, um, doing about t maybe 2000 more plants this year than last year on not mm. a whole lot more ground, um, a little bit later planting. Yeah. I, I, I prefer a smaller plant. Um, with hemp in particular, it's um, more manageable for harvesting. That's kind of, I think, going back to why I choose this style is um, I, I am one person managing 5,000 hemp plants mm -hmm. and a five-acre farm, you know, with vegetables and everything else going on um, while, you know, having kids and a life and, and yeah. that whole approach. So it's a lot of it is just energy, uh, time management, um, to where, uh, to me, it doesn't seem worth the extra time to, uh, you know, do an intensive pest preventative man uh, you know, measure. Yeah. So. Yeah. And definitely it's, it's really cool hearing about like, you're keeping in mind the ecology too, like all these, you know, the gopher snakes, um, you know, roosting hawks. I'm sure you've got some owls and stuff around here too. Um, that gets into like some of the non-cannabis stuff that I try to do is environmental education stuff and getting into a lot mm -hmm. of that of trying to get landowners in general to think broader about the ecology that their land is a part of and how to engage that ecology to allow it to support what you're doing and you support right. them and kind of generate a win-win situation rather than having this constant combative attitude towards um, you know all the other um, creatures that we're sharing sure. our space with. Yeah, and I mean, um, like you said, this isn't the typical hemp farm model that we see. Um, one, you know, hemp is quickly becoming a, a bulk agricultural commodity, so we oh, see yeah. larger yeah. farms, more mechanized, huge, huge farms. You nowadays. know, processes, and um, you know, to be quite honest, I know nothing about managing large scale industrial agriculture. Um, not something I've ever been particularly, you know, fond of the models or interested, you know, in that, that large, you know, monoculture. Um, yeah. I mean, sitting where we are looking out across the Rogue Valley, we can see maybe six or seven, mm -hmm. uh, large hemp farms that are, you know, 20 plus acres, very easy to identify either large, you know, squares of black plastic mulch or, uh, you know, brown you know tilled up uh bare plants um uh, yeah sort of thing so well you know. yeah getting into that what what are 
some of your personal concerns regarding kind of where cannabis cultivation seems to be moving toward in general? Because we all knew that as cannabis laws change, whether it be with hemp or with THC-rich cannabis, um, that it's going to move towards the industrial, agricultural, kind of traditional model. Um, so given your perspective of trying to care for the land and um, preserve um, the quality of um, the you know productivity of the land and everything, what are some concerns that you have about those industrial um, cultivation styles? Um, that, I mean, the biggest concern is that people aren't taking a lot of that into consideration it's a get rich quick uh type mentality right now um with the hemp market booming um and so there's a lot of opportunity for people to get in um kind of before you know the the market maybe either the bubble pops or um you know just there's so much more supply that the costs or that the prices drop yeah um so you see a lot of people rushing in and um you know, there's, I think there's a lot of people, uh, farming who don't have the experience, um, farming to take in, you know, kind of those factors to think about, um, in the first place, you know, the interesting thing I've noticed, um, you know, with hemp in particular is the, you know, the black plastic mulch, uh, approach, um, you know, kind of with the, three years ago or so when we were kind of the first year out of our pilot program, um, you know, you saw a couple of, of big farms, um, doing that. And then the next year, which was last year, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, a lot of new farms showed up and it was, when I asked new farmers, a lot of them from, you know, moving in from out of state or whatever, coming in big firms or, you know, mm -hmm. ventures, um, seeing the opportunity and asked their farmers why they did plastic mulch. Um, there was kind of just an assumption of that's how we grow hemp. Um, that's how we should do it. Uh, the plant can't handle a high, uh, weed pressure right. or it's an easier way to do that. Um, and, uh, one, there's not at that point, or even at this point, there's not a lot of, um, agricultural research on the crop. Um, but then, you know, speaking with long-term experienced, uh, organic vegetable farmers who've done large acreage of that, um, you know, whether or not a plant is conducive to a plastic mulch really just depends on the species. You know, there are mm -hmm. certain plant, uh, species that really, really don't do well with with weed pressure it right just, they're slow growing it stunts and, them yeah. totally they they just freak out they want to be all by themselves um and so you know you can use it selectively i just don't know that hemp or i don't agree that hemp really responds that way to that pressure um yeah. and i've seen that through experience here you know with three years of hemp and you know eight years of cannabis um uh where you know, I think the plant is so vigorously growing, it can outcompete most weeds. Yeah. Um, a lot of, there's also the misconception about, you know, weeds are sucking up all the nutrients that the plants are using, mm. when in fact that's not necessarily true. A lot of weeds um, actually, you know, use different forms of, um, of available nutrient in the soil, which is why mm -hmm. they are so pervasive in poor soils in the first place. Right, that's why they're weedy. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. You probably have a better definition of, of what that means, but um, yeah, so that's that. And then, um, you know, to that end, that approach, the other thing is, you know, a lot of these big farms, they have a lot of money at stake. They've put mm -hmm. in a lot of money, just new farms, new yeah. equipment. Their overhead is so high that there's a fear mentality of not wanting it to fail, which I totally understand. Yep. Um, another reason why I keep my cost as low as possible and accept the, you know, the gain as it is. Because mm -hmm. um, that was a lesson I learned many, many years ago with cannabis cultivation back when, um, you know, it was farmed really intensively. We poured tons of money into that crop. Um, and, uh, you know, I had some years where 
uh, the profits weren't there due to you know mm -hmm. losses and pests management that kind of thing or just overall market price was dropping and so it kind of forced me to shift that mentality to where I went completely back onto this path and started this whole journey that's kind of led me here over the last six years of like a kind of a more natural mm -hmm. um, soil building structure a lot of no-till hugel cultures mm -hmm. um, you know three years ago I grew my first hemp crop on this land and I didn't uh, amend the soil at all I didn't feed the plants any nutrient anything it was just a hundred percent native soil and irrigation water and um, you know the plants did fine you know they yeah. grew big and strong and um, did their thing so. yeah and and I guess some of that too relates to how the cannabis is going to be used at the end as well because like in medical and recreational cannabis cultivation if your goal is to sell flour then you're looking at the plant uh, differently than if the goal is extraction or something else so for instance if you're concerned about having pretty buds um, then you're trying to coax plants to swell up and have these you know dense masses of inflorescences whereas um, like a, a lot of hemp some of it's sold as flour but a lot of it's getting extracted um, and so while you're still worried about resin production you're not so concerned necessarily about um, having these pristine beautiful bud structures um, I don't know is that is that something that um, that seems to ring true yeah yeah it does um, you know with uh, new cultivation techniques you know with growing cannabis on such a large uh, scale the um, it really does kind of shift from I, I dislike the term industrial hemp um, which well, is it's what confusing to you it is but you know as I've gotten into it over the last few years and um, and gone a little bigger and a little bigger it does ring true in the in, in kind of the mentality of the way you're treating the plant you know coming from you know back when you had you know six medical plants and mm -hmm. you know you had to they were so precious and you had to uh you know really treat them very delicately and so you know to where uh the way things are harvested now and kind of thrown around and just handled much more rough because of the volume of it mm -hmm. you couldn't do it out of in a more delicate fashion yeah um you know a lot of large-scale hemp is uh, mechanically harvested, um, whether it's like stripped off the stems in the field or mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing the advent of a lot of new um, combine headers that are able to um, thrash hemp uh, mm -hmm. biomass off of the stem. Um, you know, that's... It's definitely treated differently, um, but it's kind of like a probably a profit and loss type of uh, mm -hmm. evaluation of you have so much um, material to process and only so much time or so much money and energy. Mm -hmm. You know, there has to be a way to do that efficiently, um, which is really how, you know, all of the industrial agriculture has gone. Yeah. Is, you know, well, do cutting you, costs and increasing production. Well, with that in mind, do you think that, because it seems like, cannabis flower isn't going anywhere as far as demand for it like people there's there's a strong demand for that even though the demand for extract is increasing mm -hmm. rapidly uh, do you think that's going to carve out a niche for small farms family farms that sort of thing that can put that attention in and attention to quality and uh, pampering and everything sure yeah i i think that um we can we can look at Oregon's recreational, um, you know, cannabis industry and, and we'll, we can see some similarities there to where, you know, you and I got to watch that, you know, industry grow from its yeah, inf yeah. infancy in, uh, in medical through the advent of rec and everything going. And, um, you know, you saw the larger farms, you know, maybe having one or two, multiple tier licenses, mm -hmm. you know, growing kind of bigger, a little bit lower quality, you know, mm -hmm. lower cost of production. Um, and once the uh, kind of 
once the market started to mature and there was a higher, you know, more competition over what's good cannabis and what's, you know, average cannabis or low quality cannabis, um, everything kind of average and lower uh, had a very low price point in flour and a lot of it turned into more extracts to where you have a lot of farms that it's for them, it seems to be more profitable to just grow a lower grade product, but more of it mm-hmm. and sell it all into mm-hmm. the extract um, and edibles and all that kind of stuff. And then smaller uh, farms that have really honed their craft in um, that are able to kind of like really produce that that ultra premium quality um, are able to, to create a place for them in the market. Um, yeah, I think the challenge that we're seeing now is now that the laws are changing and the demand is getting so great um, it seems like what the small farms have to figure out is kind of how to work together maybe in a co-op situation or something to meet the demand um, to be able to have enough material uh, to sell sure. um, to, to meet some of the requirements um, of some of these areas um, it's it's something I've, I've heard talked about from different people Um, especially in California, there's been pushes to try to get, you know, small farms to come together to form kind of co-op groups that, um, and you see this model in, in broader agriculture as well. Uh, Local farms a lot of times will team up under a, sometimes a nonprofit entity or some other, or a for-profit entity. And, um, everyone sort of contributing to this pool of a certain quality of product. And then, um, getting the profits um, appropriately distributed so that they have access to um, markets that are demanding quite a lot of um, a lot of material Um, because I I, like you said you and I have seen so much change here in Oregon and we've seen so many farms close up shop so many people that are bailing on farming we we saw um, so many players in the industry that were making good product and were doing their best to adapt um, to the changing markets, but then prices change. There's a whole lot of competition. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some of those uh, folks have stopped growing. Some of them have moved away. Um, and it's sad to see because, you know, cannabis is interesting. I mean, farmers in general are oftentimes uh, very passionate about the crops that they grow and being working with the land and being outside. And, you know, there's a reason that they've um, chosen to do that work. It's not easy work. It's extremely hard. Um, and it's, it's sad to see some of these small farms, you know, the people that are having to kind of throw in the towel that can't seem to find a way to make it work financially. Um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Of what small farmers can do to stay alive in this sort of rapidly changing environment? Um, I I would say um, you know read some books about running small businesses. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, not not to you know. There's a lot of a lot of farmers who are who are, have done good planning, you know, um, financially on on that front. Um, But I think a lot of farms failed because they um, took on too much too fast, uh, Mm -hmm. whether it was, you know, double mortgages and a half million dollar greenhouse and this and that um, instead of leveraging what they already had because maybe they started with nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of the farms that I see still around, you know, they were existing farms beforehand. So they were able to utilize what they already had as far as, you know, like assets um, uh, and then, you know, I gotta say like probably like the five or six best, you know, established farms that, that I know of that are still operating today in that recreational market, um, where th- I could have probably guessed that, you know, five years ago, four years ago, um, that they would have been some of the ones because, mm. um, they established, uh, brand recognition really early on in the market. Um, and they maintained the quality of product throughout that whole Mm -hmm. time. Um, and, uh, a lot of them also were highly experienced cannabis farmers for many years before Mm -hmm. and had, um, 
not only uh, environmentally sustainable t uh, cultivation techniques, they had financially sustainable cultivation yeah, techniques yeah. with, you know, more closed looped systems with utilizing their own, um, you know, different uh, animal, um, you know, husbandry techniques with, with, you know, chickens, cows, all those different things and utilizing that manure and mm -hmm. creating compost um, and huge caches of biomass that they could ferment and feed their plants. And, um, you know, when it comes down to the, as the price continues to drop, um, you know, cutting back on all of those expensive inputs yeah. um, has been really vital. And, uh, but I think brand recognition is probably one of the biggest things, yeah. um, you know, and social media plays a huge part of that in, in Oregon's mm -hmm. cannabis, um, you know, a lot of those uh, farms that I'm thinking of are gonna, you know, have 10, 15, 20,000 followers on their Instagram account, and they really have been dedicated to keeping content fed. Um, and you know, people are attracted to seeing their approaches. You know, I there's yeah. I've seen it um, for a long time with a lot of them of just like showing you know that it's an educational thing absolutely yeah. and you know especially with cannabis i think you have a large um uh large consumer base that is kind of predisposed predisposed to a more organic lifestyle mm -hmm. uh more sustainable for the earth type people and so i think that's why so many of them are attracted to that um, and i see that personally with the hemp farm um i don't do a really good job of keeping my um my social media presence uh, up and going. I've been a little too busy on the farm. Man, yeah, it's so uh, hard. It, yeah, even the stuff I'm doing, it just sucks so much energy out to try to keep yeah content flowing. But I'm amazed. Um, I get all kinds of uh, feedback from people all over the country um, that are just excited to see hemp farms that don't look like... <laughs> all the hemp farms that they're seeing, um, yeah. you know, sprouting up. And, um, and so that's encouraging. And it also creates, um, you know, a wider kind of client base for me to where, um, you know, that's mm -hmm. where I've drummed up business is, um, from companies throughout the country that, um, they are willing to pay a little bit more premium mm -hmm. Because they recognize that it's, um, you know, costs more to produce this way, maybe, or, or it's just harder work. And they value the fact that there's actual earth care involved right. in that. Um, right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and Bring, that's who I would like to work with in anyways. And so it's, it's fortunate that, that I've made those um, connections. Yeah, yeah. Trying to use your perspective and style and everything you're trying to do as a value added um asset to your to your crop that's yeah that's really important for people to understand and it takes some um, education sometimes to help people recognize that value um and just communicate just communication just explaining what you're doing mm -hmm. and so that people realize oh wow i didn't realize that oh um you know even like looking around when you were talking about weed pressure like i see you know all sorts of um miscellaneous plants that are growing up in your rows and stuff you don't seem to be very concerned um, i'm not about uh, that. no not particularly um i will be doing you know um you know manual weeding once the planting is done here that'll mm -hmm. be the next phase to go back through but um, I find that on this scale, you know, one person can, um, can manage, you know, weed management on, you know, two to three acres. Um, if you time it right, um, using the right tools, um, uh, there are, we'll go see, there's some sections I do have, um, to, it's fun to see the, uh, the different, um, fluctuations in what weeds show up year mm -hmm. after year based on you know what the spring was like what the winter right, was right. like that yep. kind of a thing so this year we have a particularly high uh density of uh what's known as pigweed yeah um yeah. it does annoy me because one um you'll see it it's in the spots mm -hmm. where it's growing it's quite literally like a carpet you know yeah. many millions and millions of these little seeds sprouting up they're quite easy to um hoe out you mm -hmm. know with a 
a wheel hoe or a stirrup or or whatever. Um, yeah, when you pull at them, they usually come yeah, out of the ground pretty um, easily. You know, but every plant uh, will grow up, and it looks a lot like amaranth, mm-hmm. and and produces millions of seeds mm-hmm. in every head. So it's kind of one of those ones where I. As far as the holistic approach, it's not really bothering my plants, but if I don't nip it in the butt, right. I will continue to increase the population of that that weed. Right. Seed Your community stock. will change. Yeah, yeah. Um, and honestly, the only thing it bothers about me is that they kind of get pokey, you mm-hmm. know. And then I'm walking through the fields, I'm getting little pokes. Yeah. Um, and they kind of like give you a little splinter sometimes when you stick on. Um, it does bring a lot of birds down into the field. Um, I don't know if those species of birds that eat those seeds might also eat bugs. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. They definitely poop. I'm sure some do That's at great. least. Yeah. Um, you know. So other than that, I have a lot of blackberries. That's another just like long term. The only way to get rid of right. blackberries is to dig out the roots. So. And even then, like if you leave a little piece, like it's, yeah. it comes back. Certainly. It's, it's uh, almost a never ending battle with blackberries. That's uh, particularly these Himalayan blackberries uh, that aren't aren't native here. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of going to the front of the process to talk about seeds, hemp seeds. Um, what do you think about when you're evaluating seed suppliers and the quality of seed that you're sourcing? And, you know, this kind of comes from, you know, last year there was a pretty significant issue with hemp seed, at least in southern Oregon. Um, a lot of farms that got um, bad batches of seed had some really severe problems. Um, and so one thing I wanted to uh, make sure to spend some time talking about is just quality mm-hmm. and how people can, um, yeah, evaluate their seed and seed suppliers. Sure. Yeah. So um, that's something I think we'll see uh, be an issue, you know, going forward um, now that the industry is really starting to gain momentum and we're seeing more and more seed suppliers um, show up so you know the um, how to evaluate whether a seed you know company is reputable or you know proficient in producing seeds Um, I mean for me here in Oregon um, you know we've seen kind of the uh, premier seed producer was you know two years ahead of everyone else when it came to um you know genetic development Mm -hmm. of uh low thc high cbd um cannabis cultivars and that was oregon cbd and the crawford brothers who founded that Mm -hmm. um they saw that opportunity they had experience with seed breeding they also spent a ton of time and money on their um selection their breeding um you know, all their analytical work and they're Mm -hmm. growing out in large populations and selecting. Um, Because what I see, you know, online is I see a lot of um, breeders um, and either they've, you know, produced a few hundred thousand seeds in a grow tent, you know, they Mm -hmm. grabbed a male. A lot of people don't understand general, uh, you know, botany and, and how plant genetics work right uh, you know whether or not yeah yeah, like oh i took a high cbd male and crossed it with a high cbd female i will get 100 percent high (laughs) cbd offspring uh and you know the other thing in the the, what happened last year the um the big seed debacle you're referring to um in particular was a you know several million seeds were sold throughout Oregon um, from one farm that produced them off of um, Crawford Genetics. Uh, Essentially, they had uh, female plants hermaphrodite in the field and spread male pollen, and those seeds that they produced, they sold as um, feminized. Mm -hmm. They sold them as, you know, basically that they were, you know, these offspring were the same as their, as their parentage. Um, and there's a couple of, you know, issues with that. Uh, you know, first of all, um, the Crawfords and just like many other, um, you know, vegetable and flower breeders, Mm -hmm. uh, intentionally only take their, uh, lines to F1 hybrids. Right. Um, you know, they've taken two, uh, two plants that are far enough apart 
um, that are expressing a quality and then they've taken the time to breed out those plants to identify that the quality is in fact um, a dominant trait that will at a high you know right, uh, so percentage you breed for right yeah. you know because a lot of you know original CBD uh, lineage was like a freak production in um, oh you know like somehow we've gotten some feral hemp to you know intermix with the medical mm -hmm. and then you know one in a hundred seeds actually uh, is producing a high CBD and a high like resin content mm -hmm. um, and then that lineage was bred with and worked off of yeah. over time um, but you know with F1 hybrids essentially you've taken two things that are far apart but have a two both have you know single or very few uh, a dominant trait mm -hmm. and when you cross those two together in their F1 generation they will right, right. they will pass along their their dominant trait to the offspring in a high frequency right you'll see a nice blending of those traits exactly that you tease out. right there's more now capable. if you take uh yeah sorry <laughs> if you take uh those seeds from that F1 population and you were to uh you know breed with them further Mm -hmm. uh, whether you've selected a new male or a new female or you have an open pollination, you know, scenario where the right. males and the females get to breed. Um, now in your F2 generation, you're going to start to see a lot of diversity in, you know, plant traits that were in the DNA of those plants all along. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in that first step down in the F1, uh, they didn't express all of those more recessive traits and, um, so that's essentially what happened there. And so the, the, yeah. the seeds that were sold, um, you know, they, that particular one was a lot of fraud and misrepresentation by some bad actors in particular. Um, and also just a lack of understanding, you yeah, know, of how that, yeah. how that works um, and gets passed on. So, so going, those were F2 seeds that were yes, sold. Yeah. Yes. Uh, also produced out of a hermaphrodite um, yeah. pollen, which can, you know, has all kinds of other implications of whether how that will affect you know the mm -hmm. the generations downstream so um with reputable seed breeders that you need to make sure that they actually have um the science backing up what they're claiming mm -hmm. um and you know not the, just random test results from a previous crop sure. that says it's, and it's high cbd yeah i think the biggest thing for me is i want to know how long they've been developing the lines that they are selling mm -hmm. um, because this type of work takes multiple generations you can only grow a plant up to maturity and pollinate it and produce seeds so many times mm -hmm. a year you know even if you're yeah. going rapidly maybe four times a year right um so you know um to know that they've done multiple generations of work on that that lineage is important um you know, the other, the fat besides high CBD, um, you know, ratios and low THC, um, there's also the feminization factor. Mm -hmm. Uh, feminization can be done in a few different ways of, uh, essentially, you know, stressing the plant. Um, and some of those are more effective than others and, and produce a higher mm -hmm. feminization rate. Um, the best seed producers are going to, you know, share with you feminization rates. They're going to stand behind their feminization rates mm -hmm. and they should be 99.85 plus if they've done it right. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of them will, you know, show you their, their proof of that, you know, mm -hmm. through testing with controls and, and it's a DNA test that they're able to do, um, through tissue right. so that they can do that pretty quickly on, on each generation. Um, it's exciting that there's going to be a deeper genetic pool available to farmers, you know, year by year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not a good, you know, in my opinion, system to kind of have any one company have a monopoly on that. Yes. Uh, yeah. However, as a as a farmer, you don't want to take a risk um, in having, you know, one, you know, if you grow out a population that has too high of a THC level, you're going to fail your uh, Department of Agriculture pre-harvest test and then your whole crop is invaluable right. yeah um so there's that um so you know seed companies should be very transparent um so you know they shouldn't shy away from questions about yeah you know um 
how long they've been developing that seed line. Uh, have they done large field trials on those genetic, um, that particular lineage? Um, and, you know, for me, the, the, the seeds that I went with this year um, came from a company that um, was new to Oregon. Um, they had been developing this line for, you know, they had it for over three years grown in Colorado. So I was able to uh, confirm that it was, you know, it had created successful crops. Right. Um, the uh, It also helped that the breeder themselves are, you know, growing over 12,000 acres of their own seed in several countries. Yeah. Um, so they'd stand behind it um, on top of that. And, you know, essentially you you should be able to ask them for a guarantee that it is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And if they don't give you that, I would, you know, shy away from that. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that makes, makes perfect sense. And there's, you know, if you are dealing with a sketchy seed supplier, then you also have to absorb more cost on yourself to do greater quality control because, if you don't quite trust a seed provider, then you're going to want to do germination tests on your own. You're going to want to do sex testing on your own um, to make sure that, you know, things are what you're expecting them to be. And that all costs time and money. Um, and then, gosh, when things go wrong, some of these farms I saw last year, so many males that came through. And uh, for anyone listening that maybe is new to cannabis and doesn't understand that, you know, you're when you're growing cannabis for resin content, you're dealing with female plants. You do not want male plants, and you do not want your female plants to get pollinated and start producing seed, because uh, that's going to impact resin production. And so, uh, there are farms just pulling massive amounts of males. And then the F2 thing on the on the analytical side um, that I have more experience with is it was fascinating as. Um, you know, an analytical science guy to see the uh, chemotypical diversity mm. in these plants that were grown out from these F2 seeds. Right. Um, every single ratio under the sun I was hearing about and seeing, and in some cases testing, and um, high CBD, you know, one to ones, three to ones, two to ones, four to ones, high THC uh, that had to be culled. Like it was just this massive, massive headache. Um, it, but it was, but it was super, super fascinating for me just seeing that diversity and just being like, wow, look at, you know, all of that, right. that potential that's it, there. The potential. Yeah. That's, I mean, like it's, 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 it's definitely... exciting on that level of like, wow, look at this amazing new genetic pool that we've mm -hmm. uncovered, but from, you know, the farmer side doesn't see the value in it. Yeah. Um, cause I mean, it, from a monetary value, maybe it's not there. Right. Um, right. You know, right. But from a, a knowledge base, it's it's pretty cool um, to see that. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Um, oh, go on, one last thing about the seed thing. The, the yeah. biggest incentive that farmers might get swayed into purchasing, you know, less than than amazing seed is cost. Um, seed cost is one of the bigger factors in hemp farming. Um, you yeah, know, quality yeah. hemp seeds typically sell for a dollar a piece. Wow. Um, a dollar per seed, a dollar yeah. per seed, maybe starting to get some discount when you get into the tens or hundreds of thousands of seeds. Um, wow. you know, so for a farm, I mean, looking across the street here, there's 11 mm -hmm. acres. They're probably planting around 2000 plants an acre. So that's 22,000 seeds. Um, assuming that they bought an extra maybe 10% of seed needed right. just in case they didn't have a perfect germination, they, you know, it would have cost them $26,000 in seed just to get started. And so, you know, for a farm, when they're offered seed at 50 cents a piece, that right. can be, you Very know, enticing. exactly. And that's, um, you know, where it is. And, and I, a lot of farms came in this year that I know where they tried, you know, that they, they, they small farms so they don't have a lot of money to put up yeah. you know so they went with what was available and i hope it works out for them so yeah yeah totally there's so many dynamics um influencing the way that people farm um and it's it's certainly hard because you know when you've 
dumped all of this money into seed, well, then you've got that pressure to make that money back. Then that leads into pressures like going back to what we were talking about earlier with like pest management and everything. You're like, well, I can't afford to lose any of this crop because yeah. uh, I need to make this money back. And so then you feel this additional pressure to invest even more to ensure that all of those plants make it through. And it's just, it just heightens this tension in the farming process. Yeah, and it, it, you know, it's interesting that we've come into a model where farmers are dependent on a seed supplier. They're not able to, uh, at this point, um, you know, the, the genetic pool that's available in order for them to, uh, you know, succeed in the regulatory environment as is, um, you know, at some point down the line, um, I think we'll have stabilized um, you know, hemp cultivars mm -hmm. that um, really truly will continue to breed low THC right. um, plants. So at that point, farmers can actually um, produce some of their own seed either in controlled plots. Um, the other interesting thing, you know, as it becomes a larger agricultural commodity and the price overall goes down and it becomes more about like how much can you grow for how little, um, you'll find more farms that are less concerned about seed in their biomass. Mm -hmm. um, I know of a 3,800-acre uh, farm in eastern Oregon that's planting um, male-female seed because they were 20 cents a piece, and they're planting, you know, like 15 million seeds or something. Wow. Um, and they're direct seeding them into the ground at 12-inch spacing. Mm -hmm. It'll all be combined. They don't care that it's right. going to be full of seed because all of it's going to get ground up, mm -hmm. and all of it's going to be sold at the lowest possible, you know, bulk pricing. Um, you know, they're not trying to get into the premium hemp right. market they're just you know able to grow it at yep. a lower cost at a higher thing in it and then they look at their their margin and, and it makes sense for them um and uh as the extraction science continues to improve that becomes less of an issue i mean uh right you can remove anything that you don't want yeah in the uh, hemp seed oil is is interesting in when it comes into uh extraction um it from my experience, um, and uh, side note, I work uh, part time at a larger hemp extraction facility here, so I uh, do a lot of um, work in that field as well. So, um, when we process lots that have a high density or, or high percentage of hemp seed, mm -hmm. especially if that seed has been cracked open through right, right, a mechanical right, right. combine or threshing, mm -hmm. um, it produces a lower quality oil that requires a lot more work to uh, you know clean up and get it into that higher quality product um, that can move through the downstream processes. And it's interesting. Um, uh, I don't know if, if any of your other podcasts you've talked about extraction too much, but not too much yet. No. So you know, what's interesting about hemp seed oil, and I don't know enough um, chemistry, you know, of the different types of um, you know lipids and mm -hmm. um, fatty acids, fatty and acids, and, and all that stuff, and polysaccharides and, and transglycerides. But mm -hmm. with hemp seed oil, it does not. Uh, it tends to be picked up even at a um, cold temperature with our solvent, which is what we're doing, and um, and then it's more difficult to uh, get that to precipitate out through the winterization process. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting. You can quite literally feel it in the oil. It has a bit of a grease Greasiness. to it. Greasiness, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen and, that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that oil, uh, we have a harder time. If you don't get it cleaned up, we can't do the distillation because it creates this violent reaction and all that kind of stuff. So large uh, industrial um, hemp processors have figured out, you know, ways to do that they've you know the mechanical engineers and the chemical engineers are now a part of it it's right. not a bunch of people saying they're scientists and they're trying to invent new science we've got <laughs> real um yeah, you right. know, real yeah. industry knowledge saying oh yeah you know petroleum distillation or canola you know distillation okay we can do this this right. is easy no problem yeah um, so it's cool to see that going so yeah the model it's interesting to see how it's going to shift over time but you know where I was going with that is, uh, it'll it'll be cool when, um, you know, sensimilia or seedless hemp is not necessarily the only way 
Right. Um, and then on the other side of that, uh, you know, we talk about hemp being this crop that can save the world and save the planet. Well, um, you know, high CBD hemp is probably not that crop. Uh, you know, right. It's right. it's wonderful. The um, the the medical benefits of that um, of that plant and the medicine is amazing. Um, but uh, until we start to utilize the plant in its high fiber, um, high food in the oil and the mm-hmm. seed, um, until we actually get there, um, you know, I don't know that personally, I don't see, you know, monocropped plastic mm-hmm. mulched hemp as being all that sustainable for the earth. Um, so it'll be cool once we shift yeah. away from, um, obviously it means like, this high CBD uh, industry is going to have to devaluate to get farmers to be incentivized to grow something that maybe only makes like five or six thousand dollars an acre instead of ten times that Uh, but once we do get to that I think we'll really see some some really cool things come out of this plant yeah and I'd love to see more uh, experiments with um, I mean there's so many different things you can do with different parts of the plant but like the hemp crete stuff is, mm-hmm. is really interesting building houses with using the um parts of the hemp plant as as part of this building matrix um there was a home in north carolina that was built and permitted yeah um and i think one recently in washington um if i'm not mistaken i i see these headlines i don't it's hard to keep track of them but more and more seeing stuff with that and um using um hemp seed and uh, materials as agricultural feed. There's all sorts of, of different things, um, even different uses for seed oils. Yeah. Um, and we did see those crops being grown throughout the world. Right, um, right, you know, right, right. And, uh, and Especially so, in, like, uh, Eastern Europe and stuff. You yep, and Canada and things yeah. like that. And and the way those, uh, they're, they're regulated mm-hmm. where their overall cannabinoid content has to be pretty low anyways. Right. Um, again, you go into the whole, like, kind of genetic seed property, you know, patenting things where a lot of countries, there's only so many permitted seed suppliers and seed sources, mm-hmm. so farmers only have a, a few choices of what they can grow. And, and um you know, so so economically, maybe that's harming those areas. You know yeah. that they're not able yeah. to switch into this particular crop. Um, but you know, talking with a, a friend of mine who um, owns a company called Hemp Technologies, and they build hempcrete um, houses. They produce um, different forms of hempcrete, hemp plastics, things like that. Um, and they're you know growing in eleven different countries, and they've been in it for quite a Excellent. long time. Um, but I, you know, he is interested in finding a way to utilize the byproduct um, hemp stock from mm-hmm. high CBD hemp. Um, but, you know, I, I, he, I don't remember his exact metrics on, on how much it produces, but, um, you know, this type of uh, plant spacing and, and everything, uh, the amount of actual like hemp curd, uh, which would be like the ground up fiber of yeah. the stock that's produced per acre and then the actual value of that by the metric ton is is so low that mm-hmm. there's not a lot of incentive for any of these farmers to utilize that byproduct. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the amount of energy it might take them to, you know, earn an extra few thousand right. dollars by taking, you know, 15, 20 acres worth of stock and get mm-hmm. it all ground up and everything. For most people, it's just not there yet. Yeah. So. What do you think about um, with all of these big hemp farms like you were talking about that don't necessarily care so much about seed content and all of that? How is that driving with, you know, the farms that do care about ensuring that all of their plants are seedless and high resin? Um, I would imagine in these really huge farms, um, they're not pulling males that or you know, not pulling a lot of them um or yeah, not even not, if they're making their best effort there's a higher exactly chance. there's just no yeah, way they're sure. going to get them all um so there's got to be as the hemp industry gets booming more and more there's got to be more pollen in the air and that pollen can travel pretty far um there's some debate over exactly how far and exactly how big of an issue that quite is. a debate yeah um but um i think it's everyone can pretty much agree that it's it's an issue that um, is contentious and um, is 
I don't know. I, I, it seems like the hemp thing is moving so fast, um, and I haven't seen a good resolution between how these different types of cannabis farmers can coexist um, without the really large farms kind of uh, ruining things for some of the the others that are really ensuring everything's um, high quality, seedless, mm-hmm. high resin. What are your thoughts on that? Um, it's a really contentious issue. Yeah. And it has been, um, the, you know, for the entirety of Oregon's, um, hemp industry, uh, to the point where, you know, the first year that Oregon allowed pilot, uh, you know, hemp farms to, to register. And, you know, there was a few dozen of them throughout Mm -hmm. the state. Um, you know, Southern Oregon has such a ingrained, um, and large, uh, medical recreational high THC, um, right. growing industry that, um, you know, there was a couple of people in the Applegate who wanted to, to try growing an acre or two of hemp and they were quite literally threatened. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. That, that they would, you know, be screwing everything up for all the other farmers and that their you know, essentially their fields were going to burn down if they planted them. And, uh, and then, you know, the next year we got some people who were willing to take the risk and really tried to push the education of like, look, I'm growing all female plants because that's you know beneficial to my hemp farm like I'm not going to you know that and then it got bigger and bigger to the scale where it's hard to keep up with that quality management and quality control and yeah um you know legally it's really contentious and difficult there are numerous lawsuits throughout Oregon about um you know economic harm done by a hemp farm whose pollen drifted into a rec farm um or even there's hemp farms suing other hemp farms for it. Mm-hmm. There's uh, um, hemp breeding uh, facilities, you know, suing other hemp farms for it because it's contaminating their crop. And and um, yeah, it's um, you know, for me personally, uh, not only is it important for my own uh, success in this crop to eliminate males mm-hmm. and pollen. Um, but just as a, um, moral or whatever, uh, how, what responsibility, responsibility, yeah, to your community, to, yes, to the other farms that exist around me. Um, I don't want to do any harm to anyone else, um, just for my own personal gain. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's right now it, it should be the responsibility for farmers to do everything in their care to limit their uh, effect on those around them. Um, it's like I said, it, it's really contentious. There's not a lot that can be done legally to prevent people. Oregon's yeah. right to farm laws are pretty strict. Right. Um, there might be some zoning things that might end up happening with different counties, different places. Um yeah, uh, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah, and maybe it'll just be something that settles out culturally. That maybe there will be um, areas where people care less um, about that, and maybe that's where some of these farms end up settling into. And other places where it's a much more sensitive issue that they tend to stay away from, just because of the. Um, interpersonal dynamics between sure. neighbors and yeah and know. I mean right now in Oregon there's nothing that prevents a hemp farmer from getting a license to grow hemp for seed and for fiber right on acreage mm-hmm. um, whether or not their neighbor next to them is trying to grow you know feminized seedless hemp or not um, and that's where a lot as far as I know there hasn't been a legal precedent set in yeah. Oregon towards that um, it's pretty pretty going to be a, a few years before all those happen and then there'll be appeals and all right, that kind of stuff because yeah. there is quite a bit of money at stake and so um you oh, know, yeah yeah there are i mean the the seed example we were speaking of resulted in a 28 million dollar lawsuit yeah um that i believe disappeared i don't really i didn't follow it yeah um, i didn't hear anything long. else about it um after the original press yeah uh, maybe it got settled i don't know but um yeah it's It'll be interesting to see how that all that all settles out. It's been on my mind a lot seeing some of these just massive hemp farms, and it's just like you know, I mean, it's just technically impossible for them to manage. Yeah, uh, and I've heard you know, there's um, 
there's going to be new developments in the industry and the farming techniques. Um, you know, there's theories that maybe, you know, there's uh, either biological or chemical products that could be given to plants to prevent them from, you know, sh basically if they were males, they wouldn't be able, they'd be sterile. Right. Uh, right. I don't know about if, whether or not that's something that could will be developed anytime soon or, or really even could be. Uh, and then even um, I've heard of people trying to develop like drone technology that could uh, detect mm -hmm. males. Yeah, yeah. Um, I heard some people talking about that, which would yeah. be cool. Uh, it it'd be quite an interesting sensor. Um, what yeah. they're picking up on, other than once there's already pollen, maybe they right, could do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, but, ma you know. maybe there's some sort of corollary they can pick up on that's um, that with some reasonable degree of confidence they can. Uh, correlate to males. I don't yeah. know. Um, the drone technology is interesting because it's gotten really big in broader ag agriculture sure. for things like n nitrogen deficiency and uh, water deficiencies and that sort of thing. But yeah, that that kind of stuff is generally, uh, from my understanding, and my understanding is limited. Um, but it seems like that's a lot of that's color based. Um, looking for certain color changes in the crops that would indicate certain types of stresses, nutrient deficiencies and everything. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, these cameras can detect, they're so sensitive and the different colors they can differentiate um, that you can get pretty sophisticated with that. Yeah, with detecting males, I, I just don't know. Um, it'll be cool to see if something can be developed. But even then, I wouldn't have a strong confidence that it's going to catch everything. Right. And, y you know, you still run into these issues. and. I haven't seen, and maybe it's just not even viable, but like tissue culturing. Um, but even with that, you c with cannabis, you can stress a plant to the point where, you know, even if you've um, cloned female plants, um, you could still stress them to the point where they'll hermaphrodite or something and uh, cause problems. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, another thing we should, you know, kind of talk about with, with seed breeding and, and the genetics. And right now there's... Um, a lot of the um, you know larger scale seed production and breeding in Oregon is happening uh, indoors or happening in greenhouse environments um, and with the plant it's interesting you will see different um, different expressions you know based on uh, light photo period mm -hmm. environmental yeah, yeah, factors yeah. you know that we hear in cannabis you know that or in in horticulture the term land race um, used which essentially means a, a plant species that's like naturalized over many generations to mm -hmm. that particular environment that's right. the way it likes to grow and express itself and the mm -hmm. types of you know chemotypes that it that it will express during those environments will you know in in cannabis cultivation you know you would hear people talking about oh i've taken this sub-saharan african land race and i can't wait to grow it out in my <laughs> tropical greenhouse here <laughs> in southern oregon yeah. and um yes it will be a very unique plant it's different than what has been developed around here will it express itself the same way it did growing you know in its right. kind of like ancestral mm -hmm. this is the way you know what it no, it won't. No. Um, and so with, with hemp breeding, um, I think uh, as we've seen the increase in production, we, we've seen a little shift in variation, uh, a little bit less um, uniformity in, in even some of the larger scale um, production facilities. Um, you know, for instance, just with Oregon CBD, they're grown, uh, they do large field trials, but they're in the Willamette Valley. Um, so, you know, a big point for them is uh, keeping the overall um, flowering time shorter to mm -hmm. avoid the uh, kind of later fall storms and rains that come right. into that area, which down here in Southern Oregon are typically come even later. It's mm -hmm. a much more arid environment here. Um, now their, their genetics seem to do wonderfully here, but um, you know, what mm. if they were bred to allow themselves two more weeks of flowering into that later October sun mm -hmm. that we typically get here? Um, you might see more, uh, more optimal plant development um, right. through then, that. Then you extrapolate that to all these different places where hemp's being grown mm -hmm. across the country, sure. across the world, and yep. all these environments are different. When we were walking through the fields earlier, we were talking about um, 
what some of the hemp farmers are going through in um, like areas in the southeast, like in Tennessee or North Carolina, these areas where they get you know, where it's humid and they're getting much more precipitation. Sure. They've got hurricane seasons. Yeah. Um, and um, one, uh, there's already some research um, that shows that that has influences on chemotypes, um, that just even humidity can uh, change uh, some of the chemical expressions in the plant. Um, but also just uh, some of the different stressors that the plant's going to encounter while growing, like having to tolerate flooding. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, over, you know, here in Southern Oregon, that's something you will never worry about pretty much except for late in the season. But right. even then, you know, it's nothing like, you know, w what I would experience growing up in Mississippi or what, you know, like North Carolina would experience during hurricane seasons or Louisiana um, where you're getting severe, severe washout flooding um, consistently. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, so farms are having to rethink, um, how to grow hemp in those areas, having to make really tall mounds that can hopefully right. survive that kind of flooding and trying to find cultivars that can maybe be a little more tolerant to humid conditions and flooding. And then you get into like, uh, microbiological issues with higher humidity right. and, um, you know, having issues with mold and, and all of that. Um, so it's... Yeah, it's interesting. It's a good point to bring up that it's, um, you know, cannabis, like any plant, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of model. It's not so simple to just find a cultivar that, based on the history of what that cultivar has done somewhere totally differently, that you think you're going to recreate it. Um, you're going to run into all sorts of challenges. And over time, um, those genetics will naturalize to where you are. Um, yep. If you're breeding, um, you'll get a, a new... Uh, naturalized little gene pool for your area and and that's something I um, saw some when I was at the University of Mississippi and uh, and got some tours and talked to the researchers at the um, the cannabis lab there um, is that over the decades of growing cannabis they grow a lot indoor but they do outdoor as well on certain years and um, they've had go through some learning curves to understand um, some differences there. And of course, there's all sorts of controversy about what you can extrapolate from the University of Mississippi's um, cannabis program um, and how it relates to cannabis breeding broadly. But um, there's definitely some, some good data that um, they're learning um, just about, like I was saying, how humidity affects chemotypes and stuff like that, that mm -hmm. um, will become apparent in the next several years as more and more states in the southeast are growing cannabis um well we've been going for a little over an hour now um this has been awesome um i'm gonna go ahead and um kind of wrap things up uh, one question i really like to ask every guest is um getting outside of cannabis completely uh for a minute what is something totally non-cannabis related um, that has you interested or excited? Something non-cannabis related that has Yeah. It can still be farming related or anything like that, but um, just not necessarily hemp or cannabis. Interesting. Um, it's kind of hard to step out of my sure, fully sure, consumed yeah. cannabis <laughs> mind because the last uh, few weeks of planting is just kind of wake up and and get things done and, and do all of that. Um, oh, okay. Well, this is easy because I can stick with farming. There you go. Um, I'm excited. I'm doing, I'm working with a local um, organic seed uh, producer here in, in Southern Oregon doing some seed trials for um, a few different varieties of uh, squash, um, corn, oh. beans, um, quinoa, amaranth, um, some melons. And so we've interplanted a lot of those in hemp rows. Um, one, just to see, you know, the, the, the interaction mm -hmm. there, but also knowing just from last year, I grew a ton of beans and potatoes and corn. Um, potatoes and corn right up next to the cannabis maybe they all got a little crowded mm -hmm. um but i did a lot of um pumpkins a lot of um storage pie pumpkin varieties throughout the field and 
uh, our farm has a nice slope, so everything kind of naturally wants to drift on down yep. through the rows, which is really nice. Um, so, you know, I think what excites me is, one, um, you know, getting to work with other plants is, is exciting. Seeing, mm -hmm. um, being able to show uh, kind of like a, a more polyculture type mindset with hemp um, for people to understand that, you know, there's so much so much earth uh, and soil uh, available in a lot of these fields that could be used for something else beneficial and that it benefits the other crop. I know now I'm crossing back into hemp. No, that's but, good uh, though, yeah. But yeah. yeah, I'm excited to see. I mean, we've got um, some, um, some melon varieties from like the Caucasus Mountain region. Hmm. Uh, we've got um, uh, Guatemalan black amaranth. Um, we've got, uh, Cheyenne white flower corn. Um, we've got an Italian pole bean and these are all heirloom direct from those bioregions. And what wow. we're doing is seeing what happens here on the first year of cultivation in our area, how they react, what do they, you know, mm -hmm. um, what can we do? Because one, we want to preserve those, and particularly with the um, with the corn, um, we are you know going to be uh, contributing the um, the profits that we can we can generate from the corn seed um, from that. A, a large portion of that will go back to the particular reservation that that was shared oh, to us excellent. with. So it's yeah. like getting to help yep. in that way. Um, and then just seeing, you know, especially with corn, uh, is, and, and many, so many vegetable species, you know, the diversity is just disappearing so quickly. So yeah, anything yeah. that we can do to preserve it, you know, um, for me, I can find so much value and beauty in the fact that things are different than everything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe this corn didn't grow as big of ears or as tall, mm -hmm. or the beans didn't have as many fruit sets. Well, and I understand why in a high production you know, type right, of, that's of cultivation. That's, that's important. They yeah. want uniformity. They want the big ones. They want the juicy ones. Um, but we've bred so much, um, you know, nutrition out of mm -hmm. our, out of our food because all we cared about was how fast they grew or how big they grew or how little mm -hmm. nitrogen we had to feed them that, um, you know, you're eating a lot of water that doesn't contain as much <laughs> yeah. nutrient in there as it should. Yeah. And so, you know, growing nutrient dense food and uh, and trying to like preserve as much of that in the world is really important and exciting for me. Yeah. Um, you know, for any small farmer, adaptability is key over the years. Um, and I'm just kind of starting out. Fortunately, I got to start out with hemp being available and hemp mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, a nice uh, bumper crop and, and can earn money. But um you know, I can't not look into the future and think about, you know, it might mm -hmm. be a year, it might be two years before hemp is not as a, much of a viable crop for me. Um, and I need to, you know, diversify if I want to continue farming, Yeah, which I do because I hate working other jobs. Farming's the best job <laughs> there is. So. Yeah. Um, but, you know, figuring out a way to do that. Um, Especially on days like this, man, it feels amazing. Yeah, it's pretty it's, nice. It's been a an amazing summer here in Southern Oregon so far. Pretty mild uh, temperatures. Really uh, mild. Yeah. yeah. Just being able to sit out here, it feels so comfortable. It's it's crazy. Um, oh yeah, and, and from my perspective too, something that I wanna do eventually whenever I have the resources is, you know, these less common varieties of um, um, vegetables, uh, ethnobotanicals broadly, however mm -hmm. people use them, as well as native plants, you know, trying to give these plants some attention and do some research, understand what uh, biochemically, you know, they're composed of and what sort of value we can draw um, from those to try to get some support behind um, maintaining those genetics. Um, mm -hmm. I think that to get support broadly for that kind of conservation I think that um, kind of have to take a sort of human centric approach because so many people that's what they connect to they don't necessarily care so much about uh, things that don't seem to affect them directly even though it all affects them indirectly um, and so I think being able to connect people with 
uh, multiple ways to value these uh, the genetic diversity is, is something I definitely want to be a part of. Try to find out what, what chemical compounds are in these things and bringing attention to, uh, you know, the importance of protecting genetic diversity to protect um, diversity of nutrition, diversity of medicine, um, all these different things. And then stacked on top of that, you know, the ecological um, components, like what are these plants do in their environments that aren't so clear to us because we we see things from a certain narrow uh, perspective mm -hmm. um, and don't always see the broader picture of um, the ecological functions that different types of, of plants play into systems and um, yeah I'm just trying to, to tease all of that out I have an ultimate dream and I hope we get to work together doing it one day but having like a, a nice like natural products research center where we can do some farming, grow out some diversity of, of plants of all sorts, have cannabis be part of that, um, but, you know, get way beyond that and um, be able to connect people very directly to the importance of pres preserving mm -hmm. uh, biodiversity broadly, because uh, biodiversity is in such rapid, rapid decline, um, and it's something that we don't feel the effects of immediately, but there'll come a tipping point where we will feel them very, very directly, yes. and then it'll be too late. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's something that definitely, um, yeah, I'm definitely very passionate about. Well, uh, you've been super, super, super generous with your time here. I appreciate um, you uh, carving out the time to sit down and chat about hemp and farming and sustainable cultivation and everything else. And uh, yeah, I look forward to. Um, walking around a little bit more on the farm and um, hopefully I can get back out here soon and help you some more and talk some more and keep at it. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd love to have you out again and uh, maybe we can, um, if you have uh, you know listeners who are interested, we can go over some more specific um, techniques you know for yeah. sustainable agriculture and um, the ways that you know I've um, you know, been shared with me and that I've discovered, uh, to lessen the, uh, overall footprint, um, yep. you know, while working with this plant and others. Yeah. Yeah. If you're listening and you're interested in us trying to make some content about, um, all these different sustainable cultivation techniques, um, let us know. Um, and, you know, as always, if you want to support the work that I'm trying to do here with the podcast, as well as, um, you know, broadly with, uh, some of my science education stuff. We have a Patreon account that you can become a member for as little as a dollar and um, get access to um, behind the scenes content, video content for these interviews, get access to full interviews before they're publicly posted. Um, and as well as um, I try to give our patrons opportunities to provide feedback, help me understand uh, ways we can make our content better and even contribute to things like editing. Um, and so whatever ways that I can try to get the community involved in trying to make some good educational content here. Um, so you can find that at patreon.com slash natural learning enterprises. Um, natural learning enterprises, is the science education company behind all of the work that I'm doing. And um, yeah, I'll definitely be out soon. Um, you can learn more about the curious about cannabis podcast at CACpodcast.com. Uh, you can connect with us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we also have a YouTube channel where clips of some of these interviews uh, will be posted. Um, just search for Curious About Cannabis on YouTube and you'll find us there. Thanks so much for listening and take it easy.